out of all regions in the world, Central Asia is probably the one that's most forgotten about. It's a region that's completely unique in a lot of cases. It's countries of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan are the only ones in the world with rising birth rates and it's a complete mixture of different societies. They look East Asian, watch Bollywood movies, speaking Turkish and Iranian languages and were part of the Soviet Union over most of the last century, acting as a Russian colony. But not only in the culture, this region is completely diverse and hard to explain also in its politics. On one hand, this region acts like a peaceful but stagnating Soviet suburb using the Cyrillic alphabet and still having communist dictators. On the other hand, these countries have high levels of religiosity in its main dominant religion Islam. While some countries handled the transition from Soviet Union to the modern world good, some others ended up as the poorest countries outside of Africa. How did it came to that place and what happened to this forgotten region in the last decades? This is a video about examining the Central Asian political landscapes, its demographics, constant border conflicts, civil war and how its bad geographics could end it up in being a hotspot for a potential world war. When you talk to somebody that you go to a Central Asia and you would name one of these countries, people would think of it as extremely random and it sounds to them as you would have made up the name of this country. This region is really unknown and most people just know it as Soviet suburbs. However, this region is largely diverse. I have gotten some deep interest in the region as I visited Tajikistan a couple of years ago with my girlfriend at the time who had family ties there. In this video I'm mainly talking about Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan since Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan are major outliers in their geopolitical situation. Both of these countries have high amounts of natural resources and are a lot more wealthy. As a result, due to their granted independence through their better geographic situation, they opted out of the international geopolitical game decades ago and only stay by themselves. Though Kazakhstan did less so as Turkmenistan. Kazakhstan still holds ties with Russia and its two neighbors to the south. Though limited and it regularly acts as a diplomat during peace talks. Turkmenistan, however, completely isolated itself and acts as a mainland North Korea. I don't see anything special happen in these countries, as their economic situation isn't good enough to open up to the world, nor bad enough to have some serious revolutions. Furthermore, the demographic trends of the inner free stands also applies to them. There's lots of talks about which of the Central Asian countries are the most best off, which one are the worst. However, the general opinions are that Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan are the more richer ones, while the inner stands are poorer. And virtually everybody agrees that Kazakhstan is the most well off and Tajikistan the worst. Central Asian geography can be shortly explained as it has two biomes. Desert in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and partly Kazakhstan and big mountains in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and also partly Kazakhstan. But as we stick to the inner free stands in this video, you can remember it as in the west there's a desert and in the east there's the mountains. This geography makes it hard for these countries to develop some basic infrastructure. Though it's much harder for Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan than it is for mostly flat Uzbekistan. As a region completely in the middle of the map, it always acted out as a suburb for one of the major powers around it. Though there were also times it got relatively wealthy during acting as a part of the Silk Road. However, these times are over now. During the Soviet times, the Russian used the region mainly for its resources and its cheaper labor. In exchange, they built up some transport infrastructure like railroads, streets and plants. They built up large cotton farms, especially across Uzbekistan and to this day Uzbekistan is the country which preserved its Soviet infrastructure the best and even renovated lots of it. Still having high speed railroads, a subway in its capital and good communication networks. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan on the other hand have lots of abandoned cities, virtually no railways and are a big museum for lots of lost places. From another perspective, Uzbekistan is also the country that got exploited the most due to their big cotton farms that were built in a place not really suitable for cotton. 
The Russians destroyed one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, the Aral Sea, that lost nearly all of its water, which is probably one of the largest human-made natural disasters in history. But there are numerous stories like that. The communists basically didn't care what happened to the region, as it was just seen as an extended arm of the Soviet heartland. However, that came back to them later. As in all Soviet countries, a lot of Russians settled there during the Soviet times for work, military and political purposes. However, after the fall of the USSR, the share of the Russian population fell in all of the Soviet countries. This trend was even harsher in the Central Asian countries. In general, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan saw a lot of the same trends happening that happened in a lot of post-Soviet countries. Fall of fertility rate, huge emigration, mostly of Russians, fall of life expectancy, fall of GDP per capita, increasing in poverty and conflicts. However, in these countries, these trends were a lot more extreme than in other Soviet countries, as Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan ended up as being in the top five of the poorest countries on earth for some time. The fall in life expectancy wasn't only due to suicide, drinking and substance abuse, but also due to high levels of starvation and conflict, especially in Tajikistan. Fertility rate dropped significantly, nearly halving in most cases, though none of these countries ever came significantly under replacement levels. During Soviet times, the fertility rates were high, in some cases even around four children, not only under the native but also under the Russian population, and the infant mortality rates were one of the lowest in the world, causing huge population rise in the region, especially in Uzbekistan, which had the highest population growth in the world, to this day having a lot more people than the other Central Asian countries, sitting at around 40 million, while Tajikistan has only 10 and Kyrgyzstan only around 7 million people. The collapse of the economy and the high young population share led to really chaotic and brutal times in the 1990s. On one day, a man who had a high paying job at the state institution and living in a good neighborhood of Dushanbe with his four kids ended up in a couple of weeks later, saw two of his kids starving, couldn't pay the rent anymore and drank himself to death after his wife got shot during some protest in the street. This were really some brutal times. But it was even worse for the ethnic Russians living in the region, who were seen as the oppressors by the natives, and a lot of Russians emigrated to Russia, Germany or got killed. It was the most harsh in Kyrgyzstan, where lots of Russians resided near the lake Isikul in eastern Kyrgyzstan, which was used as a holiday resort for rich Soviet people. Lots of the nice houses got burned down by the Kyrgyz people during the 1990s. The Kyrgyz people in general are kinda like the French people of Central Asia. They like to protest and they wave the flag no matter if they are in their own country or abroad. Due to the violence in the streets and rising unemployment, a lot of people seek refuge in rural areas. Mostly they had some family members still living there and they just moved back. That led to a creation of lots of farms in which three or four generations lived under one roof again. The rise of the rural population and the hardships these people faced during the time also led to a time of rise in religiosity, which was restricted during communist times and still wasn't greeted that well in the transitioning time. This restriction led to a rise of Islamization, especially in Tajikistan, in which these factors ignited into a civil war, causing lots of the most extreme Islamist soldiers, mostly men, to leave to Afghanistan. To this day, when you go to the region, you generally see more women than men, because a lot of men fled to other countries, and since the 2000s, a big share of the male population starts to work abroad, mainly in Russia, to provide for their families back home. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are especially impoverished, due to there being no real industries in these countries. Tajikistan is even worse, as it gets virtually no outside help, while Kyrgyzstan still has good ties with the Russians. Uzbekistan at least has a lot of agriculture and cotton farms. What's very interesting is that though the governments still try to forbid religiosity and promote communist ideas, the people there are very religious, and fertility rates are increasing in some cases even to levels higher than in 1990. That's likely because of the clan family structure, which encourages the women to have large families to continue their family name. 
also due to an increase of the rural population, physical labor is needed and kids still are the cheapest kind of workers. Although the situation got better since the 1990s, the region is far from being a peaceful one. Much like in Africa, the country's borders just got drawn up by somebody making no second thought about the populations living there, leading to lots of ethnically motivated conflicts, lots of revolutions, massacres and ethnic cleansing. And though the deadly conflicts decreased for some time, they surged again in the last years and the region is a real powder keg in the future. Central Asia in 2030 will be like what the Balkans were before the First World War and what the Middle East is now. Now we come to another big reason why I mainly only talked about the free inner stands, the Fergana Valley. When looking at the population density map, one can see that the population isn't equally spread over these countries, but most people only live in a tiny bit of land at the tribe border cross point. While most of these countries' geography consists of uninhabitable desert and mountains, in the Fergana Valley there is lots of arable land and fields that are suitable to live. Everybody once this tiny part of land, in which about 15 million or 30% of the region's population live. Most of it belongs to Uzbekistan, though Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan both have major shares of the population living there. The Soviets knew about this, that's why they put lots of their money to make up major cities outside of the Vegana Valley to build them up as capitals, like Frunze in Kyrgyzstan, Tashkent in Uzbekistan and Dushanbe in Tajikistan. That's why all of these capitals are far outside of the Vegana Valley. However, the valley is still important and there's lots of confusing ethnic diversity and borders with exclaves making absolutely no sense. Though the population is rising overall in these countries, it's rising a lot more in the Vegana Valley. As Levels of national pride are logically even higher there than in the rest of the country. Also, there's lots of inner migration from the countryside to this region. The rise of population of three different ethnic groups are fuel for very dramatic events in the future. But this is not the major problem, it's only the tip of the iceberg. The region is very dependent on water, but the sources mainly are inside of Tajikistan. There are two major rivers, the Amudarya and the Sirdaria, which provides fresh water for the whole Fergana Valley and even beyond to the countrysides of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. However, Tajikistan has some main electricity problem and it has very bad ties to its neighbors, who basically bully Tajikistan for the mountainous terrain, cause its major roads pass through Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Tajik government wants to build a dam to control the water inflow of the region and to cure its electricity shortages. However, building this dam could cause a powder keg to explode. I think that's the main reason why this dam wasn't built yet, but one day, the project will be completed and there will be some diplomatic issues causing Tajikistan to stop the water and flow to its neighbors. That will lead to two potential outcomes, starvation, war or both. Until now it's only a regional issue, but the problems of Central Asia will cause some major political conflicts, both inside and over the region, of whom of the major powers will get influence over it. I see two possible scenarios. The first one would be that after Tajikistan built its dam and some major diplomatic issue caused Tajikistan to stop the water inflow of the Amu and Siodaria, far more populated Uzbekistan starts to invade its neighbors to create some greater Uzbek identity and secure its water sources. Though the terrain of Tajikistan is very mountainous and hard to conquer, roads from Uzbekistan to Tajikistan are built good from Soviet times and Tajikistan is a very weak country, which also has much less national pride than their neighbors. Though it won't be an easy war, I think that Uzbekistan will however get full control over Tajikistan. However, to have full control over its water flow, Uzbekistan also has to get invade Kyrgyzstan, as they also want to control the whole Fergana Valley. But the take on Kyrgyzstan won't be as easy as one might think, and to successfully invade it will be much harder than Tajikistan, though its population is much lower. However, Kyrgyzstan has more major population centers in the Fergana Valley than Tajikistan has and they have much higher military presence in the border region. Also the Kyrgyz military is more experienced 
than that of both of its neighbors, due to having to fight off some revolution in Kyrgyzstan approximately every 10 years. The Kyrgyz are also very nationalistic people, and if they start big revolutions over some corruption case, they won't react that friendly to potential invaders. Also, the Russians have much better ties to the Kyrgyz than they have to the other countries in the region, and none of the outside powers want a new big player in the regions. That's why I think that China or Russia, or both of them, will buff Kyrgyzstan military to protect it. I could actually think of a future in which Kyrgyzstan tries to put the whole control over the Fergana Valley and create some horrific apartheid-like situations there, as most of the population in the valley is made up of Uzbeks. Kyrgyzstan would geopolitically be a completely other country if it has the control over this tiny bit of land, as it would have a much higher population and would become the hegemon of the region. That would be very beneficial to both Russia and China as they would at first have a new important ally in Central Asia with access to huge cotton farms and also because there wouldn't be just one huge power in Central Asia but two as Uzbekistan still has some population centers outside of the valley. In this case Uzbekistan would become an American ally as Uzbekistan would sit in a strategically good place for the US not far from its main rivals. Another potential future I could think of is that both Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan team up and invade Tajikistan to get control over the dam. I don't know how, but either they would split up the country, for example Kyrgyzstan gets the water resources, while Uzbekistan gets the Fergana Valley, or they would go to war against each other. The future is not that unlikely, as Uzbeks and Kyrgyz are genetically and culturally much closer than they are to Tajiks. In that scenario, Tajikistan would turn to India or the US to seek for some protection, while Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan might get some help from the Russians. However, I think that in this scenario, one of the major outside powers would attack the newly formed bigger country as nobody wants a big influential power in the middle of the map. In both of these scenarios, Kazakhstan would either try to arrange peace treaties, do whatever the Russians told them to do, or just be passive and eat popcorn while watching the thing alongside Turkmenistan. Whatever happens, Central Asia is up to no good, and in one or two decades, it will be a major topic in the international news. Let's hope for the best. Cheers.